All right, forget the pleasantries. Let's just get straight to the chaos. If you clicked on this video, you already know the topic. Using fuzzing tools to find unknown vulnerabilities. Now, you might be asking, what the hell is fuzzing, Joe? Think of fuzzing as throwing literally everything you can at a program until it breaks. Imagine you have a new toy truck. A responsible adult might test it by rolling it gently back and forth. Fuzzing is like handing that truck to a destructive toddler and saying, go nuts. The toddler doesn't care about the rules. They're going to try jamming weird shapes into the exhaust pipe, pouring juice in the gas tank, and hitting it with a hammer. When the truck inevitably breaks, when it crashes, leaks, or freezes, you know exactly where the flaw is. In cybersecurity, the truck is the program we're testing, like a web browser, a PDF parser, or a new network service. And the juice and hammer are enormous amounts of random, malformed, or unexpected data. So now you might ask, why do we even bother with this chaos? Or what kind of bugs can fuzzing actually find? Fuzzing systems are incredibly good at finding certain categories of catastrophic vulnerabilities, including buffer overflow, denial of service, cross-site scripting, and general code injection flaws. These are the low-hanging systemic errors that make an application crash, leak memory, or freeze entirely, the things that leave a clear trace of failure. However, fuzzers are much less effective when dealing with silent security threats that don't immediately result in visible crashes or error messages. We're talking about things like subtle logic flaws, certain types of spyware, worms, trojans, and rootkits. These malicious programs are designed to hide and operate quietly, often only exploiting existing business logic, which a fuzzer looking for a literal crash will completely miss. Understanding that distinction is key. Fuzzing is fantastic for finding memory corruption and input validation failures, but it's not a silver bullet for every security threat out there. To make sense of the chaos, we break fuzzing down into two main methods. Think of this as the difference between a toddler breaking a toy and an engineer taking it apart methodically. Method one, mutation fuzzing or the toddler approach. This is the simplest way to fuzz, often called dumb fuzzing. The process is simple. You take a known, valid input, like a simple configuration file or a short string of text that the program usually accepts. Then, you repeatedly mutate it, you flip random bits, you multiply the file size by 100, or you swap a comma for a zero. You just introduce random garbage. It's dumb because the fuzzer doesn't actually understand the rules of the target application. It doesn't know HTTP from HTML. It just changes things until something crashes. This approach is fast and great for finding obvious flaws in basic input handlers, but it often wastes a lot of time testing invalid inputs that the program rejects immediately. Method two, generational fuzzing or the engineering approach. This is the smart fuzzing method. The process requires structure. Before you start, you have to know the rules. For instance, if you're fuzzing a PDF viewer, you need to understand the PDF specification where the header is, what the data types are, and how the file structure is supposed to look. The fuzzer then generates inputs that are almost perfect, but violate a specific rule. It might create a perfectly valid JPEG header, but intentionally declares the file size to be zero or an impossibly large number. This tricks the application's deeper logic, targeting flaws that dumb fuzzing would never find. This is much slower to set up, but far more efficient at finding subtle systemic flaws because the application doesn't reject the input immediately. It tries to process the malformed data deep in the code. Now that we understand the two methods, let's look at the actual code that shows this principle in action. We need to create a function that is deliberately fragile and then attack it with fuzzing logic. I'm not gonna show you a complex zero-day exploit, but I am going to show you the simple Python code that proves the core concept. A program that is written to trust the user will always break. Here we have a simulation of a function called process user input. Now, a lazy developer might write this assuming the input will be reasonable, but notice this line here, max length equals 10. If the input is longer than 10 characters, the program hits this fail condition and simulates a crash. Our simple fuzzer logic here is running 20 tests. 
It's generating data using a mix of normal characters and control characters, and crucially, it's testing different lengths, sometimes long, sometimes short. When I run this, we see a lot of successful runs where the data was short, but then bam, there it is. Vulnerability found, program crashed. The input that caused the crash had a length of 14. We found the program's breaking point simply by throwing slightly unexpected data at it. This is exactly what professional fuzzing tools do, but instead of 20 runs, they execute billions of tests a second using AFL or libfuzzer to find those memory errors in real software. Finding a crash like this is the first step toward developing a full exploit. Now we know exactly how to break it. So we've seen the principle of chaos is simple, but to do this job properly, you need automated high-performance machines. You can't rely on ancient software. Here are the modern tools that handle the real work. First, let's talk about libfuzzer. This is powerful because it's a compiler integrated fuzzer built right into the core framework that turns code into an app. Think of it as a tiny robot pit crew that lives inside your race car engine while you're building it. It never has to leave the garage. This makes it incredibly efficient and lightning fast for languages like C and C++ because it finds memory bugs instantly without needing to run the whole finished program. Then we have AFL++. If libfuzzer is the quick pit crew, AFL++ is the determined intelligent robot that never sleeps. The original AFL was great, but AFL++ is the modern successor. It's smarter and much faster. It uses a special trick. It watches which parts of the program its chaotic inputs actually touch. If its random data reaches a hidden piece of code that hasn't been tested yet, AFL++ says, aha, and slightly changes that input to explore that new area until it finds a crash. It's like a determined treasure hunter, focusing only on the unexplored parts of the map. Now, let's talk about the big leagues, OSS Fuzz. This isn't a single tool. This is a free, continuous fuzzing service run by Google. Think of it as the global security guard for the internet's critical infrastructure. It runs tools like AFL++ and libfuzzer automatically, 24 hours a day, against thousands of critical open source projects, stuff like the Chrome web browser, vital Linux tools, and major libraries. They literally find an average of one high-severity zero-day bug every single day. If you're dealing with web applications, there's also the dedicated tool, Burp Suite Intruder. This is different because it's specifically for testing websites. Imagine you have a login form. Burp Suite Intruder is like a high-speed machine gun that takes your input and rapidly fires millions of variations at the web form, checking for things like cross-site scripting or trying to guess weak credentials. It helps us test the exact boundaries of a web application to see if it leaks information when we throw unexpected data at its parameters. Finally, there's Fuzzbench. This isn't a tool that finds bugs, but a platform that helps professional security teams decide which of these robots to use. It's like a fuzzer Olympics. It compares the efficiency of different fuzzers against the same target code, ensuring they always choose the most effective tool to find bugs before the bad guys do. Before we finish, let's talk about the final piece of the puzzle, best practices. How do the pros judge if their chaotic testing is actually working? They focus on three key metrics. First, they focus on testing speed. The math is simple. The more tests you can throw at a program in a given time frame, the more likely you are to find that hidden crash or error. Speed is everything in fuzzing. To make this happen, professionals use tricks like parallelizing the tests across multiple processors, reducing time limits, and running the application in headless mode, meaning without a user interface. If there's no screen to draw, the computer spends all its power on breaking the code. Second, they focus on reducing test cases. Now this sounds weird, but here's the problem. When a fuzzer crashes a program, the input file that caused the crash might be huge, maybe 10 megabytes of random junk. You need to know the exact single byte that triggered the error. Reducing the test case means narrowing that massive input down to the smallest possible change that still causes the crash. This simplifies the analysis and helps security engineers understand exactly which part of the code is related to the error. Third, the most scientific metric is tracking code coverage. 
This is a measure of how much of the application's actual source code the fuzzer has managed to execute. The idea is simple. The wider the coverage, the more thoroughly the fuzzer has tested the program. If your fuzzer is only hitting the login screen, it's going to miss the errors hidden deep inside the file saving function. Measuring this gives you crucial insight into your testing robot's effectiveness and helps you tune its activity to hunt in the darkest corners of the program. And that brings us to the end. Now you understand the chaos of fuzzing, the modern tools that run it, and the metrics they use to find those unknown scary zero-day vulnerabilities. All right, we just took a deep dive into the beautiful chaos of fuzzing. You now know that finding a zero day isn't just about luck. It's about throwing billions of intentional errors until the program screams. If you found this breakdown of fuzzing useful, please smash that like button. It really helps the channel grow. What other advanced hacking tools do you want me to break down next? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. One life, one shot, make it count.